everybody. My name is Erin Shigaki. I'm an artist and activist in Seattle, Washington on Duwamish land. And I am here today on behalf of both Densho and Common Area Maintenance to have a conversation with Lauren Ida, who is an amazing artist, educator, and entrepreneur. Welcome, Lauren. We're really excited to have you. I know that you have a very busy schedule um, traveling between Cambodia and Seattle. Um, so let me just dive right in and we'll get to know you. Um, I'll start with kind of a softball. So how is your spirit today? Good. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, it's a crazy time. It's been a crazy year, but I'm really happy to be here in Seattle. And I get, I got to see a few people social distance and it's nice to reconnect with my hometown and uh, see the rain, smell the ocean a little bit. So I feel pretty good today. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I think it's been a pretty challenging year for everybody. Um, but I was wondering if, you know, this pandemic, racial uprising election year has brought you any unexpected gifts. Yeah, it has actually. Um, the main thing is that I have had more time to make my own art, um, which has been really great for, for me personally. Um, normally before COVID, I would be uh, guiding contemporary art tours, working with artists in Cambodia, like more at a faster pace and um, doing lots of other things all the time, traveling back and forth between Cambodia and Seattle. Um, but I've actually been in Cambodia for the entire pandemic until about a week ago, um, which has just given me a huge amount of time to work on my own projects for the first time in quite a while. So yeah, that has been real good. Awesome. Um, so I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about your creative and artistic beginnings for those of us who don't know you very well. Okay. Um, I've been drawing and painting and making art since I can remember as a child, I was always making art. Um, I grew up in Seattle, I'm born and raised in Seattle, and I'm a graduate of Cornish College of the Arts. I graduated in 2014. And for the last um, 12 years, almost 13 years, I've been back and forth between Seattle and Cambodia, um, about half half sometimes I'd spend a year here sometimes I'd spend a month here and go back for a couple years so back and forth between um, Seattle and Cambodia those have been my two homes uh, I make art in both places um, and I'm primarily a cut paper artist um, so I do very intricate highly detailed very fragile um, smaller works for like exhibition and also larger scale installation I cut everything with a scalpel with an exacto knife. How did you come to uh, cut paper as kind of the one of the mediums that you're best known for? Um, actually I dabbled with it at Cornish the first time I went uh, uh, 2006, 2007, but it didn't really um, become a serious thing until after I'd lived in Cambodia for a few years. Uh, I used to be an oil painter and I really enjoyed doing portraits, but um, when I came back from volunteering for two years in Cambodia between 2008 and 2010, I didn't have uh, the financial means to continue with oil painting and have space and materials. Um, so I thought, how can I share these ideas and these images and these stories of the incredible people that I uh, came to love in Cambodia um, using photographs, but doing something to depict them in a different way um, that was cheaper than oil painting and easier and cleaner than oil painting. And so it just became like, okay, what, how can I simplify this more? How can I simplify this more? And so I referenced the photos that I took in Cambodia and just started cutting negative space out of single sheets of white paper. And then that developed into the larger installation, like the 30 foot long installation called the Memory Net that I've done several times and installed temporarily in several places around the world. And um, multi-layered uh, framed pieces for exhibition with like ink washes and multiple layers that make, that create depth and uh, shadow play and stuff like that, so. Yeah, it kind of developed organically out of necessity. And then I really like the process. So I find it really meditative and relaxing. 
And it's also something I can pick up and put down and pick up and put down. So kind of like I do it every day a little bit and it's um, yeah, very satisfying medium for me. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've watched some video footage of you creating some of your pieces and it's it's really quite mesmerizing to watch too, just sort of as an onlooker. Um, the large, you said 30 foot piece called the memory net. Um, yeah. You said that's traveled and been installed in multiple places? Yeah, um, the first version of the memory net um, was installed first at Art Exchange Gallery, my representative in Washington State um, in Seattle. And that was in 2017. And it basically the memory net is a 30 foot by three feet wide, approximately um, single piece of paper that I cut and it looks like objects are ensnared in it or like trapped in it. Um, so I had a exhibition in 2017 called How to Trap a Memory at Art Exchange. And that was kind of the centerpiece uh, that was going down the center of the gallery. And the objects trapped in it are um, symbolic of a memory, an experience, a person, um, sometimes from my own life, and sometimes I ask for community input. So for example, in 2018 um, at Best View Gallery in Ballard, I opened the doors of their little art space and invited the public to come in and contribute objects that were symbolic of the place that they felt um, most at home. So that could be like a metaphorical place or a literal place. Um, and whatever object they suggested to me, I asked them to sketch it or just tell me. Um, and then I got the backstory behind those objects and I cut all the objects into the memory net, um, which was a very interesting process. And then I actually took that memory net out to the university district and asked uh, some homeless youth that I used to teach art to through sanctuary arts to pose with it. Um, so also I've installed the memory net in Cambodia several times, um, in rural areas, in uh, the sunken forest, which is like an area that, uh, that they dammed and then the water level came up and now there's all these dead trees that, are, that appear to be coming out of this massive lake. Mm -hmm. um, so I took the memory net out there and employed some local fishermen to help me put it in the tree and help get me in the tree and then did another shoot that way. Um, yeah, so that's been a really interesting and fun project that I will definitely continue with. Yeah. So how does um, your medium, I guess, particularly thinking about the memory net, how does it travel from place to place so well? I guess it's, it's a pretty durable paper or is it a different kind of paper than you would use for, you know, some of your smaller works? No, actually it's, um, it's just a roll of drawing paper, uh, 90 GSM Strathmore or other kind of regular drawing paper. It's high quality paper, but it's not durable. Um, and so those memory nets, both of them don't exist anymore for that reason, because I take them around, I put them in a tree, I let the kids in the village play with them. I, you know, stuff it in a plastic bag and take it on a boat or whatever. And then it's, it's ephemeral, it dies. And it's part of my process, actually. Um, the last one after the memory net was in the tree and it spent the whole day, like basically near the water or in a boat, um, it finally started to break in a major way. So I actually let parts of it go and sink down into the water. That was in uh, Northeastern Cambodia. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and have you found that you get very different responses when the piece is inside a gallery like art exchange versus in a place like the sunken forest? It, it seems, that seems like a really rare opportunity for an artist to be able to show work in such different locations. Yeah, I think it's, um, it definitely reads differently when it's still pristine in a gallery. I have never shown a damaged one in a gallery, but it could also be very interesting. Um, the clean memory nets usually go to the gallery first and then out into the world second. But now I've been doing it a few times. So I think maybe it might be interesting to show like a clean net and a, and a dirty net or like a almost, almost perished net. Um, when it's in a gallery, you can really see the objects close up. And, you know, I usually give like a key, like a legend so that people can follow along and kind of identify some of the objects. And 
I put the definition of what meaning that symbolic object has for me or for somebody else. Um, yeah, but when it's out in the world, it's more like an object, uh, like one object, like the memory net, rather than like a series of small objects. So yeah, definitely enjoy it in a different way. And it takes on different meaning depending on where I put it or how I place it um, as well, which is really fun to play with, yeah. Yeah, that must be really satisfying. So let's go back to um, how you wound up in Cambodia at all. I know that the, you have quite a long backstory about kind of traveling to different places, but um, I think people would be interested in knowing how you wound up landing in Cambodia. Yeah, um, it was actually an accident. Initially, I bought a ticket to Bangkok, but there were protesters that shut down the airport in um, 2008. So I was rerouted to Cambodia and um, I had friends of friends there. So I kind of had like a insider's experience right away. I wasn't really like a real tourist tourist there. Um, I met some really fantastic local people. Uh, the first couple of weeks that I lived there who are still my dearest friends today. Um, so I, right away I had like, I was very lucky to meet some really nice local Cambodian people. Um, one of them is an artist with the collective that I founded in 2018 um, <clears throat> also, La Vie Long. So now I have an adopted son and I work with eight Cambodian contemporary artists at my house, um, my rental house in Siem Reap, which is nearby the ancient temples of Angkor Wat. Um, we work together. I supply them with high quality art supplies, uh, which are donated by mostly by Seattle um, artists or supporters of Open Studio Cambodia. And we have exhibited in at Art Exchange in Seattle, also in Paris and around Cambodia. Um, we basically I mentor them because they're at the very beginning stages of their art career and uh, need a little like advice getting from point A to point B. Um, in what is a very brand new contemporary art scene in Cambodia after uh, the genocide of the 1970s completely decimated uh, the artistic community. So yeah, it's really fulfilling work and really interesting work. So I definitely am, will continue with that into the future. But I really appreciate um, me still being able to make art and show art and do public art projects in Seattle as well. So the two together are really ideal for me. Yeah. Um... I want to ask you a little bit more about the collective, if I may. I, I looked through um, the artist's work and I'm curious, you know, how you met these artists or how they, how they came to find you. Um, and I just, you know, I'm so impressed with the diversity of um, media that they work in as well. So I wondered if you had any, you know, stories or vignettes about some of your artists. Yeah. Um, well, Lavi Long is the watercolorist uh, I work with, and he was my one of my first Tuk Tuk drivers ever in Phnom Penh in 2008. And we just became friends, and I noticed that he was painting watercolor in his downtime. So between uh, driving customers around in his like little motorbike trailer thing called the Tuk Tuk, uh, he would sit in his Tuk Tuk and paint watercolor. And I asked him about it. He said he'd been studying since, or like he studied as a child, um, very little, but he had always been doing it as a hobby, he really loved it, but he didn't really feel that it could be a career. He would not know how to start like making that into a career. And at that time, you know, that was so long ago, I didn't have the idea to start Open Studio Cambodia, but um, now he is one of our top artists at Open Studio. Um, and Moan Chia, I met in Kampot through, um, another artist who I used to work with. So kind of like people just came to me in the beginning. Uh, one artist came in the beginning and he needed a place to store his art and was kind of struggling to find high quality art supplies. Um, didn't have money for framing. So I helped him first with just like storage space and some nicer art supplies. I framed his best piece. I found a buyer for it. And then he brought his friends like a Moan Chia, the printmaker. Um, a lot of the people that I worked with in Kampot uh, on the South Coast initially where we started uh, were physically disabled or deaf um, because there's like a really cool nonprofit down there called Epic Arts that works with um, disabled youth. 
And so Moanchia had lost both of his arms in an electrical shock accident 10 years ago, um, but he's a very prolific uh, block printer. And I did teach him how to do block, block printing as well. Um, for example, Kenya Hell is uh, the young woman we work with. We only work with one young woman because it's very difficult to retain young women um, in the art fields in Cambodia for various reasons. Um, she came to me with some drawings. She just randomly walked into a gallery that we were installing an exhibition in, in Siem Reap. Um, she's 21 years old now, so that was a year ago. And she started just asking me questions like, what is this place? I've never been in an art gallery before. I don't know any other artists. I don't have money to go to art school. Uh, really, really love to draw. Here are my drawings. Can you look at them? And, you know, I said, okay, come to the studio later and sat down with her and started to talk to her about like what she is interested in. And she's like, oh, I like to draw, I like to paint, but I don't really know if I'm good at it or whatever. And then it's like, okay, show me your Instagram and your Facebook. And I find that's often like a useful tool to be able to see what people are interested in. And she was a great photographer. Um, she had a natural eye and like a, color, a cool color palette, really cool ideas, uh, a lot of very interesting self-portraits. And so now that's what she does. Um, and I also work with a really fantastic painter and sculptor named Van Chavon, who um, was enslaved on a Thai fishing vessel for two and a half years. And he just needed a little bit of encouragement to have to be brave enough to tell his own story through his art. Um, he felt that because other people had told that story before through art that he would be accused of copying and that his voice was not important um, on that subject, which was obviously very personal to him, very um, traumatic and impactful to his life. Um, so now he's making very, very, very beautiful uh, paintings and sculpture about that experience. Um, so sometimes I teach them technical skills, but most often it's just like talking about ideas and uh, building confidence and finding a market for their work and helping them administratively a little bit. Yeah. Mm, that's so powerful. One thing that we both do is work around the Japanese American incarceration that happened during World War II. Um, and I have a few questions about that matter. The first is, when did you first learn about that history? Um, I sort of had the knowledge that my family had been through that um, experience as like as a childhood, you know, thing. Um, although I don't feel like it was really explicitly talked about until, I don't know. I don't know that it ever really was explicitly talked about too much in my family. Um, but as an adult, I became interested in learning about the history on my own and particularly relating to my art because I found the historical photos from that time uh, really profound. And um, because of Densho, there's just like a fantastic archive of photos from that time. And also my own, uh, my grandmother's older sister who I call my grandma Clara. Um, she also has always been interested in photography and so she's kept extensive photo albums from like the first photo of my great grandfather in America around 1900 until now, <laughs> um, all the way through, through camp and everything. So yeah, I just found those photos to be really interesting, but the history in my family um, was not really uh, talked about very much at all. Yeah, um, well, first of all, you're so lucky to have an album full of images, you know, from immigration time, but then especially in camp, right? Since cameras were supposedly not allowed or yeah. they weren't in the beginning. Um, so I think that's really cool. Yeah, um, what, so what did you learn in sort of subsequent research or discussions with your relatives about how the incarceration experience impacted them? Um, well, what I observed was that the, that I found myself um, not knowing anything about my Japanese heritage at all. Um, my father is Japanese, my mother's not, so I'm biracial, but I found that I actually had no information about uh, anything having to do with Japanese traditional culture 
uh, maybe a few food food things, a few foods kind of made it through. Um, but no language and no other cultural traditions at all uh, made it down to me. And so that was kind of strange as an adult. I realized that, that that was the case. And so I started investigating more on my own. What I in inferred from that realization of not being in touch with the traditions of my Japanese heritage was that probably, um, I mean, I figured that after camp, um, my, my grandmother would have been very embarrassed and very shy and like not wanted other people to, to know that she was Japanese or I feel like they felt shame about that. And I think that was mentioned to me. I think that was said to me at some point in my childhood, but I'm not really sure. So um, all I know is that after the war, um, they kind of, they tried to rebuild their lives in Washington state and Seattle. And that seems to be when most of the, the traditional aspects of how they lived disappeared. Um, yeah, so my father also was not raised with those Japanese traditions either or language or anything. Um, so I, I think that probably because of the shame of being incarcerated for being Japanese during the war, they probably tried really hard to um, hide the fact that they were Japanese or at least like not outwardly celebrate um, the Japanese parts of their heritage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of a sad um, but, but really true part about surviving, I guess, is, you know, assimilating or an idea of assimilation. Um, but so now you are embracing this history in some of your work. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, um, I, I will also say that my grandmother's older sister, Clara, has been a really important resource for me to learn about um, what happened to our family and how life was before the war and uh, how she felt about it. So she was interviewed by Dencho in 2013, 2014. Um, and she lets me use the photos and she's still alive in West Seattle. Um, she's 101 now. Wow. Um, and so like she's been a really important resource. I can ask her or could before ask her direct questions and she would give me um, amazingly detailed information that she remembered. So that's been a really important resource too. Um, could you tell us a bit about your work that you're making about the Japanese American incarceration these days? Yes. Um, so a very large mural, a 120 foot long um, mural just went up in Federal Way a few months ago um, at the Federal Way Sound Transit Center, which is under construction right now. Um, it is a vinyl printed reproduction of uh, 12 panels that I made from hand cut paper in my studio in Cambodia and then digitally sent them over and they were printed here. Um, because of COVID, I couldn't physically be here to paint them by hand. Um, so that's what we had to do. Uh, that piece incorporates the memory net with symbolic objects from myself and also from um, Japanese incarceration, like objects that I, that I know were affiliated with the Japanese American incarceration in some way um, from Lawrence Matsuda's book, My Name is Not Viola, from my own family's stories and photos and um, from Dencho. And then I put a family portrait from before the war of my grandmother, her older sister, their two brothers, and my great grandparents, like at their farm in Rockland, California. Um, and they're all kind of connected by memory net with memory net objects. Um, and there's a photo, or there's a uh, part of that mural that is my grandmother's older sister, Grandma Clara, with her ID number from inside Tule Lake uh, concentration camp and et cetera, et cetera. I also asked a few people who I knew are just like generally asked on Facebook and generally asked my community um, for objects relating to immigrant and refugee uh, experience in America. So there's like a Hmong baby carrier in there. There are some uh, Cambodian American uh, symbolic objects that people suggested to me as well. 
Um, so the whole piece is like very long memory net with symbolic objects trapped in it. And then some uh, portraits of my family members. Yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, if you're comfortable talking about it, I guess that's another thing that you and I have in common is that uh, we both had public artwork about the incarceration defaced. And I wondered uh, if you had any thoughts to share on, on what happened with that and sort of how that affected you. Yeah, uh, as soon as that, as soon as um, the splashing of my mural panels happened, I thought about what happened to your work immediately. Um, and actually like dug a little deeper and researched more about what happened to your work at um, Bellevue Community College. Uh, what happened to mine was basically somebody took a box cutter and slashed through many parts of the mural, mostly on faces of people in my mural. Um, and also through faces depicting like other murals nearby my mural uh, by other POC artists depicting black faces as well um and so at first we were like i mean sound transit said oh is that an act of racism i don't know they repaired it they they put they taped things back together they printed some panels that couldn't be saved um and then it immediately happened again <laughs> and so then sound transit came out with a statement that said they believed it was an act of racism and the press uh wrote some articles about it and i was in cambodia still at that time um, so this is the most important, most large scale piece of public art that has ever come to fruition and been installed of mine in my life. And it was really, really devastating for me to, to go through that experience of um, feeling personally attacked and personally, you know, um, yeah, personally attacked in like a racist way a few, a couple of times. Um, watching your art get this days, I didn't really think about it before. I didn't think how much that would hurt, but it was pretty bad. It was pretty profound, um, made me very angry and very sad. So um, right now, actually, I'm working on re like repairing or renovating the panel, we can call it, um, with using the ancient art of uh, repairing broken pottery with fine metals like gold. Uh, which is also Japanese. And so I'm like taking gold paint and gold wire and sewing it back together across the whole slash mark. Um, the one panel that was, that was really badly damaged that they had to reprint. So I'm repairing it with gold and then it'll be like a, an art piece and Sound Transit is gonna let me put it up with a statement as well. Oh, I love that. I love um, reclaiming, you know, yeah. that situation which we did at Bellevue College as well um yeah it's it's interesting they, it's it's the intergenerational trauma that really bubbles up especially when you know the the defacement is about our history right it's 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 pretty intense yeah. um, so what other projects are you working on right now public art wise or um or other in the Seattle area or the states uh, a lot. There's, let's see, there's the Washington State Convention Center edition garage door. Um, all the public art project, all the public art that I'm making for these different projects um, have to do with uh, World War II, the Japanese during World War II, or some part of the history before or after. Um, after Black Lives Matter started, I really, like, decided, I made a commitment to myself that um, I would continue to make work about that topic for public art in Seattle and not really anything else for a while. Um, so let's see, there's the Washington State Convention Center garage door uh, that's cut from metal from my paper cut design. Um, there is common area maintenance. There's going to be an illuminated sign out the front here and maybe a window display. Um, there's a project for sound transit in a ceramic tile mosaic that are like these uh, five elevated panels that go along the bike trail to the new Sound Transit Center in Redmond um, that will be in the future, but working on it now. Um, there is another mural project that hasn't been announced yet in uh, downtown Seattle. And 
um, a project about actually specifically about the um, Japanese American contribution to agriculture in Bellevue um, in like a mixed use zone in Bellevue that I'm working on right now as well. Um, incorporating the words from the poet uh, Larry Matsuda, Lawrence Matsuda into my work as well. Ah, uh, yes, our mutual friend. Yes. Great. <laughs> um, can you tell us about the piece that we are looking at that's right behind you? Yeah, um, this piece is called Rock, Paper, Scissors, and it is um, derived from a photo I found in the Densho archives um, of some boys in one of the camps, I'm not sure which one, uh, playing rock, paper, paper scissors. Um, and the photo really struck me because I remember a story uh, that Grandma Clara told me about how um, when, they, when the Japanese were moved into the camps, um, they actually, okay, they suffered in many, many ways, but uh, one of the things that was kind of an unexpected positive surprise for her and she saw in other young people um, was that suddenly Japanese families who may have been more isolated like in rural areas um, before, suddenly had a lot of other people around, a lot of other kids to play with. So they started like rec centers and sports teams and schools and they ran in packs around and um, it destabilized the family structure, um, which probably was not positive in many ways, but it also was like, um, it offered a lot of socialization and like fun times for, for Grandma Claire, which she remembered fondly. Um, so this, the kids playing in this photo really reminded me of her telling me that and then also there's, um, I use chance or the element of chance a lot. The idea that everything in life is kind of like could be changed at the drop of a hat or um, that there's an element of unpredictability in, in life in general um, at the drop of a hat, like the Japanese incarceration, we saw um, just one day, you know, their freedoms were taken away and they were moved out of their homes and they had nothing left. So, um, and also uh, a lot of people that I am close with in Cambodia are Khmer Rouge survivors or children of Khmer Rouge survivors um, and their lives were completely destroyed and at the drop of a hat as well. So one of the symbolic objects I use a lot in my work in the memory net and other pieces is as, a di as dice to symbolize that element of chance in everything we do. And I thought rock, paper, scissors was also kind of a symbol for that. Um, the piece that I made for the sign project for common area maintenance um, is called The Artist. And it was one of the most striking photos I found in my research recently on the Densho archives as well. I believe it's from Thule Lake where my family was incarcerated. Um, it's a man who is like attending a life drawing session inside the prison. And he's just sketching a woman who's sitting on a platform um, as a hobby. And I thought that was so fascinating that um, I noticed through many, many photos that I find from all the different camps, like they really continued to try to have some kind of normalcy in their daily lives, even though they were in such a terrible predicament. Um, I was really inspired by the fact that, that people would still attend a life drawing session or, um, you know, make an event or community events like that. Um, just to pass the time and like try to, you know, pursue some kind of skill or education, even though they were incarcerated and they had no idea what their future held. Yeah. Yeah. I love that about our community. And I, I find that that helps me um, kind of balance my emotions, you know, working in this subject matter as well. Like just looking at these moments of resistance and resilience, you know, that, that sort of counteract against what I'm sure was a ton of depression and anger and sadness. So I'm, I'm really, I'm glad you're looking at that too. Yeah, there were, there's, um, it reminded me also of this historical photo that I found many years ago of Mati um, painting from his bed when he was very, very ill towards the end of his life, I think. And he had attached a paintbrush to the end of a very long stick and was painting murals on his own wall, like in his, in his bedroom, I guess. Um, 
he couldn't get out of bed, but he was still making art like that. And I think um, art is such a powerful tool for, for self healing, for, for getting through difficult times. Like I know this whole 2020 situation, if I wasn't an artist, I don't know how I would have handled it. Like um, being able to meditate while doing art and express yourself creatively and have something productive to ground yourself. And I feel really, really lucky that it's part of my daily practice and it's always been part of my daily practice um, because I do think that it helps get people through tough times. For sure. Well, thank you very much, Lauren, for taking time out of your busy schedule while you're home in Seattle. Um, we're glad to have you and we're gonna really enjoy having all of this new Lauren Eda art surrounding us um, to kind of help us through these continuing, you know, crazy times. And I look forward to the next time we talk, which hopefully will be in person. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's really nice to meet you. Bye.